Adam Al Misri is an Egyptian who claims to be an ex Christian and is more interested in making videos about Islam than his own faith. He made a video about five human errors in the Quran, trying to prove that the author of the Quran is not God. Inshallah, I will respond to all his points. So let's watch the clips and come back. Muslim believers and apologists claim every day that the Quran is the word of God, revealed by God to the Prophet Muhammad without a single human error. They also claim that the Quran is full of scientific miracles that prove its divine origin. But is that really true? I will keep the so-called scientific miracles for another video. But in this one, I want to show you five clear human touches in the Quran. Five human errors and personal touches that can only mean one thing, that the Quran was written by a human being. Let's be clear, if anybody can prove a single error, contradiction or corruption in the Quran, then the Quran would be proven to be false and not from God. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran? If it had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. Allah challenges the entire world to produce a single piece of evidence against the Quran. And for more than 1400 years, nobody was able to show a single mistake in the Quran. Number one. Insulting others and using swear words is one of the most interesting psychological phenomenon studied in human being. It is a great coping mechanism and a natural relief in moments of intense emotional overwhelm, like anger or frustration. Swearing is simply put, a human need. Yet we find in the Quran that God swears and attempts to insult others. He's trying to compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation. Using human emotions and behaviors to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not acceptable. And logically, it doesn't make any sense to compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the all-knowing and all-powerful, to human beings that are not all-powerful and ignorant. He is creator of the heavens and the earth. He has made for you from yourselves, mates and among the cattle mates. He multiplies you thereby. There is nothing like unto him, and he is the hearing, the seeing. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or comparable to him or equal to him. Nothing can rival Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, there is a whole chapter in the Quran, Surat Al-Masad, consists only of five verses that is purely and plainly swearing at a guy called Abi Lahab. God was so angry that he started cursing him and even calling his wife names, exactly like teenagers calling each other names. The only way people like him can try to disprove the Quran is by lying. He said that God was so angry that he started cursing Abu Lahab. How did he know that? He's grasping at straws and trying to create an emotional argument without facts. The Quran is wrong because Allah spoke against the enemy of Prophet Muhammad. Non-Muslims are so passive and they get triggered by listening to strong language. Peace and love is the solution. God calls Abu Lahab's wife Hamalat Hatab. God is so angry and emotional that you can see it clearly in his words as he starts saying, May the hands of Abi Lahab perish, and he himself perish. He will burn in a flaming fire. And even his wife, the firewood carrier, Hamalat al Hatab. Even though she was from the elite society, by the way, God calls her Hamalat Hatab. God, in his anger, wanted to lower her class with untrue status. Typical swearing in a state of anger. Are these words from God or a deeper human psychological need to insult another? I think this guy didn't realize that he just proved Islam and the Quran to be true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised Abu Lahab a punishment in the hellfire in his lifetime. Abu Lahab was alive and heard the verses condemning him. The only thing he had to do was act like a hypocrite and say the shahada and claim to be a Muslim to prove the Quran to be false. But he didn't. He fulfilled the prophecy of the Quran and died as a disbeliever. May the hands of Abu Lahab be ruined and ruined is he. His wealth will not avail him or that which he gained. He will enter the burn in a fire of blazing flame. And his wife as well, the carrier of firewood. Around her neck is a road of twisted fiber. Allah is clearly speaking out of authority. And you know as an Arab how superior the Arabic of the Quran is. And how it can't be replicated. You are an Arab. Why not try to meet the challenge of the Quran and produce a chapter like it? Say if the mankind and the jinn gathered in order to produce the like of this Quran, they could not produce the like of it, even if they were to each other assistants.
about calling the wife of Abu Lahab the carrier of firewood. It is not an attempt to lower her status. Why are you trying to deceive the people? You are an Arab and you have access to the books of Tafsir in the original language. For example, according to Tafsir Tabari, one of the explanation of the verse is, she used to bring thorns and throw them in the way of the messenger of God. May God's prayers and peace be upon him, so that they would enter his feet when he went out to pray. I am 99% sure that you already knew that, but you're trying to deceive the non-Arabic speaking non-Muslims. Number two, the Quran constantly uses the word Injil and contributes it to Jesus. Injil is the Arabic word for gospel. Gospel, the English word, comes from the Latin good spell, meaning good news. Injil in Arabic also comes from the Greek word evangelion. Ev means good and angelion means news. The good news which goes into Arabic as Injil or Ingil. But what are those good news? The interesting fact that the good news of Jesus' death on the cross and bringing salvation to the world is exactly the doctrine that the Quran rejects. The word Injil or Evangelion has always meant good news of salvation. Even before Jesus' time, Alexander the Great used the term Evangelion, claiming that he brought salvation to the world. So when the Quran contributes the Injil to Jesus Christ, yet rejects his death and salvation, it is a state of cognitive dissonance. It's funny how he claims to be an ex-Christian, but still believes that the Bible is a valid source of information. The only cognitive dissonance comes from you. Is the Bible reliable or not? When the Bible claims that Jesus died for our sins, do you believe it or not? If you do, then you're still a Christian. And pretending to not to be, to not be questioned about the corruption of the Bible. And if you don't, then you are in agreement with the Quran that Jesus, peace be upon him, didn't die for our sins. And we send following in their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah. And we gave him the gospel, in which was guidance and light and confirming that which preceded it of the Torah as guidance and instruction for the righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Injil to Isa the son of Mary peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. But sadly the gospel of Jesus peace be upon him was corrupted and distorted and we don't have the original gospel of Jesus peace be upon him. Codex Sinaiticus is the oldest complete New Testament and is dated to 400 years after Jesus peace be upon him. So how can you trust a manuscript that can't be linked to Jesus peace be upon him? Him. We reject the Bible. We believe Moses, Jesus, and David, peace be upon them all, received the Torah, the Injil, and the Zabur. Narrated Ubaidullah, Ibn Abbas said, Why do you ask the people of the scripture about anything? While your book, the Quran, which has been revealed to Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is newer and the latest. You read it pure, undistorted, and unchanged. And Allah has told you that the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, changed their scripture and distorted it, and wrote the scripture with with their own hands and said it is from Allah to sell it for a little gain. Does not the knowledge which has come to you prevent you from asking them about anything? No by Allah. We have never seen any man from them asking you regarding what has been revealed to you. Number three, the Quran constantly tells us that the Bible, that is the Torah and the gospel were corrupted and the truth was manipulated. This is why God decides to send the Quran through his prophet Muhammad. But amazingly, the Quran also tells us that even the Prophet Muhammad himself seemed to have doubted that the Quran may be from God. Weird. Right? Yes, very weird. And I am 100% certain you will refute yourself. So please continue. Wait, it gets more interesting. Surat Yunus verse 94. إن كنت في شك مما أنزلنا إليك فاسأل الذين يقرؤون الكتاب من قبلك. If you, O Prophet, are in doubt about these stories that we have revealed to you, then ask those who read the scriptures before you. Hang on a second. God is telling the Prophet that if you are in doubt, which is already weird as it is, but even weirder, that God says to him that the way to verify the truth is to go to those who have corrupted the books and manipulated the truth before. Those will verify the truth, so you have no doubt. 
I'm sorry, what? First of all, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never doubted the message. It's like me saying to my son, if you are my son, then listen to me. It doesn't mean that I'm doubting that my son is really my son. So if you are in doubt, O Muhammad, about that which we have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord. So never be among the doubters. And we know that historically, the Jews were waiting for a prophet in Arabia. And when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, announced his prophethood. They rejected him because he was not an Israelite. Narrated Abdullah bin Salam. The description of Muhammad is written in the Torah and the description that Isa will be buried next to him. And who is Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu an? Who confirmed that the description of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is in the Torah? Well he was a Jewish leader and a rabbi who accepted Islam and confirmed the description of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in the Torah they had. Ask them O Prophet consider if this Quran is truly from Allah Allah and you deny it and a witness from the children of Israel attests to it and then believes whereas you act arrogantly surely Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people number four another very interesting story is that moment when Prophet Muhammad went to his adopted son Zaid but Zaid wasn't home accidentally the Prophet saw Zaid's wife his daughter-in-law barely wearing anything the Prophet innocently felt sexual attraction towards her and desired her. That is not the interesting part. We are all human after all, including the Prophet. But the interesting part is what happened next. God decided to intervene and sends down two verses in the Quran. And even though the Quran is supposed to be God's ultimate message to humanity at large, these two verses have no benefit whatsoever to humanity at all. This again shows his ignorance about the Quran and Islam. These verses are important and we understand from them that adoption is not allowed in Islam. Therefore Zaid radiallahu anh is not his adopted son. Nor does he regard your adopted children as your real children. Adoption is not allowed in Islam. So again you are wrong. And God said, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْد مِنْهَا وَطَرَى When Zaid totally lost interest in keeping his wife, we gave her to you in marriage. There is no blame on the Prophet for doing what Allah has ordained for him. God's ultimate message to humanity here is saying, one, women are merely objects. When Zaid is done with her, you Muhammad, can take over. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never said when Zaid is done with her like she's an object. You're an Arab and you know that. It clearly means that Zaid dissolved his marriage with her. And why not have Zainab speak for herself? Why are you guys obsessed with speaking on behalf of Muslim women? Narrated Anas, when this ayah was revealed about Zainab bin Jahsh, so when Zaid had completed his aim with her, we gave her to you in marriage. He said, she used to boast to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your family is married you to him, while Allah married me to him from above the seven heavens. Zainab radiallahu anha, our mother was so proud and happy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala married her to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Who are you to say now? Wait a minute. Who are you? Number five, one of the most controversial verses of the Quran, even among Muslims themselves, is verse number three in Surah An-Nisa. فَانْكَحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثْ وَرُبَاعَ فَإِنْ خُفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدَةْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ Marry women of your choice, two, three, or four. But if you are afraid you will fail to maintain justice among them, then content yourselves with one, or those bond women in your possession. The problem here is not about monogamy or polygamy. It is far beyond that. In this verse, God is legalizing sexual affairs for men. He commands that a man can marry two or three or four women as long as he can maintain justice among all of them. Otherwise, if a man cannot justify multiple wives, then he has two options. He either marries only one woman or sleep with slaves in his position. This is a moral argument. And my question to you is, where do you get your morality from? If your morals are subjective, then you have no legs to stand on when trying to speak against the Quran.
This is not an argument for an error or contradiction in the Quran. He's trying to claim that he knows better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about morality. And let's make it clear. The source of servanthood in Islam is limited to one source, which is war captives, that's it. Abu Huraira reported that the Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, None of you should say, my slave, Abdi, or my slave girl, Amati. All of you are slaves of Allah, and all of your women are slaves of Allah. Rather, you should say, my boy, Ghulami, my girl, Jariyati, my lad, Fataya, or my girl, Fatati. And we are allowed to be intimate with female servants. If the man gave his consent, and the female gave her consent, what's your problem? Righteousness is not that you turn your faces toward the east or the west, but true righteousness is in one who believes in Allah, the last day, the angels, the book, and the prophets and gives wealth, in spite of love for it, to relatives, orphans, the needy, the traveler, those who ask for help, and for freeing slaves, and who establishes prayer and gives zakat, those who fulfill their promise when they promise, and those who are patient in poverty and hardship and during battle, those are the ones who have been true, and it is those who are the righteous. Freeing servants and slaves is recommended in Islam, and it is a praiseworthy action. We Muslims get our morality from the Quran, and the sunnah and we don't care about what liberal society is the moral they keep changing and they only follow their own desires prove to us that liberalism is objectively true and then you may have a case but till then keep your views to yourself bye have a great time I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe I responded to all his points and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. You can watch this video about Sneeko and Young Dan talking about Islam and Allah and don't forget to subscribe for daily uploads. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum.